Hi everyone, I'm Nichelle De Silva, and I am so excited to have the opportunity to speak with you today about the future of education. A little bit about me. I'm the creative director of Building Bridges, a collaborative of artists. And we bridge divides and bring diverse groups of young people together through programs in the creative arts in Sri Lanka. I'm also a PhD candidate at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I'm writing my dissertation on museums and museum education. I have been in the education sector for a very long time now, and not just as a student. I have taught students ranging from primary school all the way up to the university level, and in very different subjects from science to English to art history to design thinking. I've taught in locations ranging from village schools in Baunia in the north of Sri Lanka to tutoring prison inmates in New Jersey in the US. Along the way, I've become familiar with some of the current trends in education, as well as some of their problems. While I will touch on some of these issues today, I also want to share with you what I believe needs to be at the forefront of the education sector so that we can all become better learners together. As many of you are aware, education is becoming more connected. And this has only accelerated because of the pandemic. On the one hand, we know that COVID has severely disrupted how places of learning operate. According to a report released by UNICEF, more than 168 million children, that is 1.68 billion, have been left out of school for almost a year. On the other hand, many of us have learned to adapt through online learning, using existing platforms such as Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, and so on. This conference, for example, is bringing together leaders from all over the world. And while I'm unable to be with you live today, I've been able to record this message and send it over to you because of our existing technologies. I myself have been able to attend talks and conferences, either live or recorded, taking place all over the world that I would never have had access to before the, the pandemic. And it has shaped my PhD research in really important ways. But if we look at the news, we see report after report talking about how children in Sri Lanka, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Chile, El Salvador, and more, climbing trees or sitting on the roofs of their houses just to get the signal or reception necessary to attend their classes. Internet-based distance education reached only about 45% of Sri Lankan students in public schools in 2020. So, while some of us are getting access to more educational materials than ever before, others are really struggling to keep up. We need to ask ourselves, in a world of increased internet connectivity, who is still disconnected? And how can we keep adapting to make access to education more widespread? Next, you may have noticed how much easier it is to turn to other people, not just our family, not just our friends, but even complete strangers to answer any question that we might have. How many times have we typed a question on Facebook, on Twitter, or any form of social media and gotten a whole wave of responses? Sometimes this can be even better than an encyclopedia. Last year, for instance, I sent out a tweet asking scholars to share with me some of the books on museums that had made the greatest impact on them. More than 50 people, many of whom I didn't know, responded with extreme generosity, giving me so many useful recommendations for books that changed their perspectives and that I can now use in my classes. This is something that I see university scholars doing quite a lot. And this use of social media as a crowdsourcing tool can be very effective for expanding what we know, what we learn and what we teach. But you may be equally familiar with all of the misinformation and disinformation that exists on the internet. 
misinformation meaning things that people share that they believe are true, but aren't really. Think of those WhatsApp messages or those Facebook posts that your mother or your cousin or your uncle very confidently shares with you that tell you how drinking everything from hot water to lemon juice to even alcohol can help cure the coronavirus when we know that that's not true. In situations like this, it's not smart to rely on the crowd. Even worse are instances of disinformation meaning falsehoods that people share deliberately to stir up unrest, such as the campaign launched to recount the votes from last year's presidential election in the US, based on false allegations, such as the claim that there were thousands of false votes being cast for current president using the names of dead people that might sound funny when you hear about it from afar, but resulted in deadly riots in early January. Now that we live in a world where you don't have to just rely on one person, one teacher for information, how do you get the right information? Now there are courses and resources that are beginning to teach us how to sort truth from fiction like a fact checker would and think critically about where information is coming from, tracking its original source, gauging if the source is trustworthy. We are also being taught to think twice before we share anything. Social media sites like Twitter have come up with pop-ups that ask you to read articles before you retweet them. So we need to ask ourselves more than ever, by sharing something, are we helping or are we causing harm? As a result of all of this information, much of which can be accessed online, we are also beginning to customize our education even more and more. From Khan Academy to edX, Websites hosting online courses are enabling learners to pick out topics and skills that they want to know more about and expand their horizons at their own pace. Whether you were the student who was bored in class or the student who wished the teacher would just slow down a bit and explain things one more time, massive online open courses or MOOCs as they're called, promise to tailor your online experience to suit you. But a closer look at the numbers shows that more than two thirds of enrolled students came from countries categorized as having very high human development, while almost another third came from those in the high and medium categories. Less than 2% were from those categorized as having low human development. So again, we need to ask ourselves, are sites like these really democratizing education as they claim to? Or are they helping already highly educated people to just gain further skills? Are these sites closing the education gap or are they helping to widen it? I want to think about everyone when we imagine the future of education, not just those of us who are already well-placed to thrive in a rapidly changing world. This means moving from equality where everyone is given the same resources like a Zoom classroom, regardless of what they really, really need to succeed, to equity, where everyone gets the support they need to succeed, and finally to justice, where the supports are no longer needed because we have removed systemic barriers. When we think about a more just education system, I believe that it has to be one that is both creative in its approach and also one that nurtures creativity in learners. And I'm not just saying this because I'm an arts educator. We know that many jobs that were once completed by humans are now undertaken by machines. It is possible that half of today's work activities could be automated by 2055. According to a Future of Jobs survey, conducted by the World Economic Forum, many jobs will require a higher degree of cognitive abilities, such as creativity and logical reasoning as part of their, school, part of their core skill set. And these are skills that are the hardest to automate. Giving students the opportunity to flex their creative muscles will serve them well, no matter what the future brings because they will have had practice in thinking about problems that don't have just one solution. 
here are just two examples of the kinds of exercises that we do with students at Building Bridges. The first, on the left, is a game that we call Toy Factory, where everyone is divided into small groups. They have to rapidly prototype an idea for a new toy that has never been seen before. Participants can sketch out their ideas, combine them with other ideas, and then use craft supplies like cardboard and clay to mock up a rapid prototype. The strangest ideas are often the best ones. One of the ideas in our sessions was a flying bicycle. But as the sketchy drawings turned into a more fleshed out prototype, the group added little details like a hanging basket for your lunch or an at attached device that you could call home if you were getting late. Our workshops also tackle more difficult themes like inclusion and belonging. Um, and there's one activity that we do that asks participants to reimagine the national flag and think about the symbolism that the flag depicts. I've included a photograph of that on the right. At a time when we're focused on increasing internet connectivity, I believe that we need to be thinking equally seriously about how we teach students to connect with their inner creativity in ways that they can use in any situation. For a more just future, education also needs to become more collaborative in all kinds of ways. As you've seen, all of our workshops for building bridges include several activities for working in groups. But that is not the only kind of collaboration that I mean. In an age when we are getting more crowdsourced answers than ever, there are ways to make those connections more meaningful. I'm going to mention only two initiatives from Sri Lanka here, but Scholar X is a mentoring program that pairs Sri Lankan undergraduates with experts based around the world for about six months. They gain insights into applying for their masters and PhD programs and learn about new vocational pathways. Another initiative, the Strivers Network, aims to provide a free mentoring program for secondary school students who don't have the resources to navigate applying to prestigious universities by themselves. I want to emphasize here that good mentoring is really a form of collaboration. Mentors don't try to force mentees into a pre-configured path, and mentees don't rely on their mentors to give them all of the answers. Together, they learn important lessons about themselves and about each other. Finally, to move from equality to equity to justice, I believe that we must have the space to be critical in the most constructive sense of the word. Critical thinking is the process of looking at an issue analytically and evaluatively, always with a question in mind. Empowering students with the confidence to question constantly can help them see things differently. And as educators, thinking critically about the content of what we teach, the methods we use to teach it, and the systems in which our forms of education exist, help us see root causes for problems more, more clearly. These problems need to be solved, not only at the level of the individual and the classroom, but at the scale of whole educational systems. I want to leave you with this one technique for critically thinking about the heart of a problem, the five whys. Now, if we return to the image of children sitting in trees, uh, looking for internet access that I shared with you a few minutes ago, our thought process might go something like this. Why are the students sitting in the tree? Well, because their internet connection is unstable. Why? It might be because little investment was made into providing these areas with better infrastructure. Or you might take your answer in a different direction and say it's because the mode of online learning provided doesn't align with the realities on the ground. Depending on this first answer that you come up with, the response to your next why question might be that the lack of investment in better infrastructure results from a reliance on an outdated mode of teaching that was not sustainable during a crisis. 
Or you might say that the misaligned form of online education is the result of authorities making a blanket switch to online learning in line with solutions conceived in other parts of the world, rather than in com communication and conversation with communities. Either way, you will start digging deeper into the core problems, and there never is just one. Thinking deeply about these problems will help us to start thinking about restructuring not just the content, not just the immediate environment, but the very policies and structures that frame what we value in the process of learning. Right now, we are at an important juncture as the pandemic forces us to think differently about how we learn. The future of education could go in any direction. It could continue to benefit the few, or we could think creatively, collaboratively, and critically about how we make a more just world for all. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. If you have any questions, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Nuchelle, or you can email me at buildingbridgeslk at gmail.com. Thank you and goodbye.